Now we live in a world where everyone, everyone, with very few exceptions, believes that governments have to fund science. And the argument is very simple. Science is a public good. You produce a piece of research and others can capture that research at much less cost to themselves than it costs you to make it. Therefore, by doing research, you actually preferentially empower your competitors. If it costs you £100 to do a piece of research, then you're £100 poorer for it. If your competitors can pick this piece of research up for only, say, £10, cost of buying the journal, then they are as informed as you, but they have £90 to spare on investment in the next stage of the development of the product, and therefore you'll get bust. And therefore markets punish research. Standard economic theory, taught everywhere. It's called post neoclassical endogenous growth theory today because Paul Romer, a friend of yours, um, has uh, put this in terms of uh, neoliberal, neoclassical economics. But it simply says, as I've described, that markets do not supply public goods. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Rather than get, get into that argument, forget I said it, forget I said that, and let's just talk about the substantive matters. I'm very happy to over a pint. No, no, that's no, great. We had a great conversation at dinner. So forget, I shouldn't have said that. i am just give you the straight argument, public goods, it's cheaper here. Okay. Universally accepted. Um, um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone in the whole world who agrees with me when I say it's not true. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, the problem with the theory is that every empirical fact disproves it. It's just that people ignore the empirical fact and simply assume the theory must somehow be true. So, let's have a look at some facts. Uh, America is a very interesting example of this. The Americans, traditionally and historically, simply did not believe that governments would fund science. They didn't know it was meant to be a public good in their ignorance until 1940, and whenever anyone tried to fund it, they just found that the government wouldn't fund it. So, for example, you all have heard of the Smithsonian Institution in America. The Smithsonian Institution was created by a man called Smithson, who was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Northumberland, an Englishman, and he was so bitter by the way he was treated here in England, they left all his money in the 1840s to the States to build an institution to be named after him that would outlive the memory of the Percy's, he, would, he absolutely was cross with his illegitimate father, so to speak, and would be dedicated to science research in his memory and perpetuity. Uh, the problem with this, the American government didn't believe in the funding of science, even if the money was given by other people, and the money was sent to a bank in Arkansas, where it stayed for about 13 years. And after 13 years, it slowly dawned on the American government that the money was being stolen by local politicians in Arkansas, so they took the remaining money back and created the Smithsonian. But that's how reluctant the Americans were to fund science. And the interesting thing is that the American government decided to fund science in 1940 to coincide with the Second World War, and this continued, of course, into the Cold War. And now the American government is one of the world's largest funders of science, in fact, the largest funder, the single largest funder of science. You also have economic data going back to the 1820s to the current day. And economic data is very, very clear. American GDP per capita has grown at 2% a year, year in, year out, smoothed out over 10-year periods since 1820. We've now nearly had 200 years of economic growth in America, linear. And what happened after 1940 when the American government started to fund science? Nothing. Underlying rates of economic growth, underlying rates of total factor productivity, completely unchanged. It's exactly the same story in Britain. We had an industrial revolution, we created the world's largest, richest economy. There was no government funding for science in this country of any significance whatsoever, just the odd penny here and there, until 1913, when the Medical Research Council was created. And of course, the big force behind the Medical Research Council was the current fear that people had about eugenics. Eugenics, of course, being the concern that the quality of the human race was deteriorating because we were allowing the lower classes and black people and other undesirables to breed and therefore we had to do what H.G. Wells and Bernard Shaw told us we had to do, which was to find painless ways of killing these people. Ideas that were in fact taken up, as we all now know, by Adolf Hitler. But it wasn't a really great reason for funding science in this country, the Medical Research Council. And since then we've had an enormous amount of government funding for science in this country, and underlying rates of total factor productivity and economic growth 
no impact. Most fascinating of all, in 2003, the OECD published a complex longitudinal multivariate analysis, which you can get on the web, and it's called The Sources of Economic Growth in OECD Countries, 2003. And they look at all the OECD countries over a 25-year period, and they look at anything you can think of measuring, they look at, and then see how all these impacted on the 20 or so OECD countries over that 20-plus year period of time. And what the OECD reported, all of all this, is, by the way, is in this very good book called Sex, Arts and Profits. Um, what they reported was that there was a correlation between the amount of money a country spent on R&D research and development, which is a broader thing than science. Science is sort of what happens in universities. R&D is the bigger thing that happens in companies as well as universities. And there was a direct correlation between the amount of money a country spent on R&D and subsequent rates of economic growth. But only between the private funding of R&D and economic growth. There was no correlation between public funding and economic growth. Even worse, there was crowding out. Every time a government spent a pound, a dollar, or a euro on R&D, the private sector in that country spent 1.25 pounds or dollars or euros less. So the government funding of R&D not only has no positive impact on economic growth, but by crowding out the private R&D, actually damages economic growth. And that is the OECD which didn't know how to explain its own data, was intensely embarrassed by its own data, and is very pleased with the fact that everyone has kindly ignored it ever since, because it was too upsetting. Three people have said this. I was, he, he says modestly, the first to point out that OECD data showed that the government funding of R&D simply crowded out private funding disproportionately. There's another economist showed the next year that, actually, in Washington, D.C. I can't remember his name, but it's in here. No one's ever referred to his papers. And then the OECD's huge study, which no one has ever referred to. So we have an extraordinary situation where all empirical evidence, I don't mean anecdotal, you can always come up with anecdotes. You know, if this government hadn't done that, we wouldn't have this. But no systematic economic historical data supports the suggestion that science is actually public good that requires public funding. And if you look at America until 1940, it had become the richest country in the world by 1890, which is 50 years before, and had invented things like the aeroplane and Edison and all the stuff that you know, the Americans are famous for by 1940. As I said, they've been the richest country in the world for 50 years, i.e. the most technologically advanced country in the world for 50 years without government funding science. On the other hand, you have countries like the Soviet Union or India or China, which have enjoyed enormous government funding for science and also enjoyed huge poverty. Um, I remember once, I didn't know her at all well, so this isn't name dropping, it's just a true story. I was once in the 80s asked to go and brief Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister uh, on various things and on the government funding of science. And she said to me, she said, what this country needs, she said, are more Nobel Prizes in science. And I said, oh, you mean like the Soviet Union? <laughs> and she said, don't you see me? <laughs> And that's really how deep the conversation generally is.